Luke, appreciate you being on the, the Tread Podcast. Um, I guess my first question for you is, you know, obviously people are familiar with your brother. Yep. Um, you know, you guys have what four or five years age gap between the two of you. Yeah, about five years. So, what, yep. what was that relationship like? growing up like was he kind of like your, the mentor figure did you guys play catch together like were you catching his bullpens like growing yeah. up like yeah he talk, was talk us that. he was significantly older than me we got a brother in between us so we were always playing baseball basketball football together um i think what was big for me was i saw him like be one of the best high school players in the country he went to chapel hill pitched in a college world series was a first round draft pick got to the big leagues quick so in my mind i'm like if he can do it i can do it you know i play with him he's no different than me he eats the same food so anything he did was always attainable for me. Um, and then having him as a resource, even now, being able to get into specifics of things is, uh, has always helped. So you never viewed like playing, being a, being a, you know, at every step of the game that you saw him reach, you never viewed that as unattainable. Like it, it took the, like these right. guys are superhuman yeah. off the table. You were like, well, I, didn't I literally saw him struggle yeah. here, here and here. I'm struggling right now, like I can get through it. Yeah, and I saw that he had to get better. There were times in the minor leagues when he was terrible. He's obviously got his whole own story with, with the yips and everything, and um, that it's a battle and a grind, but if you keep getting better and do what you do well, and um, you know, the big leagues is tough, but it's not impossible. Um, at the end of the day, it's a human versus a human, and um, it's attainable, so. So what was it like, not just with him, but with your dad having that experience as a, as a pro catcher for a number of years? Yeah, so my dad was huge. He probably taught me everything I know, and he caught in the minor league, so he loves baseball probably more than anyone I've ever met. Um, I got a grandfather who played in the Yankees organization. I got another grandfather who was uh, coached college baseball at MIT for 30 plus years. The field's named after him. I've got an uncle on my mom's side that played professional baseball. Um, I got a cousin who's a, my age, who's a big league outfielder. And then I've got my brother. So we kind of got a whole family of baseball going on. Um, even the girls in our family, the girl cousins, have played sports at Ohio State, Clemson. Um, so kind of everyone's done something athletically, and it's just kind of kind of what we do. So given that, like, do you feel like there's – how much of that is, like, the nature versus nurture debate, right? Like, it yeah. seems like there's always, like – like, the, the Birdie uh, brothers, for example, they both throw 100. Like, right, I play with It Nate. seems like there's, there's some genetic component there. Like, there has to be. But how much of that is just, like – it was no longer like this unattainable goal and you were just surrounded and immersed in it from a young age. Yeah, I don't, and I don't know the answer to that. I know like, I think kids learn best by visually learning. So seeing somebody do it and then trying to emulate them. So my dad always had a good arm. Um, I told you the story off camera about Peter Gammons came up to me and said the two best arms of any catcher I ever saw were your dad and Johnny Bench. So that was pretty cool to hear. Um, I think if my dad would have pitched and I had another scout after a game who was old as dirt, he told me, he said, if your dad would have pitched, he would have thrown 100 miles an hour. Um, so he had the genetics to do it. But my mom wasn't athletic. She never played any sports. She was the loving, the loving, positive one. Um, but yeah, I guess just seeing good pitchers throw and then being a kid and trying to emulate Pedro Martinez or whoever it is. And um, I didn't really throw hard till maybe sophomore year of high school. Middle school teams, travel ball teams, I was middle of the pack kind of a little bit of a late bloomer. Um, and at the time, like sophomore year through maybe high 80s, started to creep into high 80s, and at that time was hard. And then I've kind of thrown hard since. Who, who would you say your biggest influences were as far as you mentioned, like Pedro Martinez yeah. being somebody that you looked up to, tried to emulate? Uh, any other kind of mechanical comps, people you tried to emulate? Uh, did you try to steal pitches from this person, that person? Were you um, picking anybody's brain? Like how did you yeah. kind of settle on the current delivery that you have in your current arsenal? Um, it's been a it's been a progress. Uh, um, as a kid, I loved Pedro. I always thought my brother's mechanics were awesome. I, in high school, I tried to emulate him. Um, as I've gotten and kind of learned myself, I tried to raise my arm slot to chase vert. That kind of hasn't worked going back down. Um, and then whatever pitch I'm trying to learn, I look at who does it well in the big leagues, and I find their grip. Um, like I'm learning a sinker. I'm looking at my brother's grip. I'm looking at Clay Holmes' grip. Um, and just trying to get that comfortable and still rip it fluidly, athletically, not changing, you know, too much, and then seeing the action I want on track, man, and that's kind of when I give it the go to add it to the arsenal. So could you guys talk kind of through the, the arsenal adjustments and changes that you've made through this offseason? Because I know you have yeah. kind of made some, you know, pretty significant adjustments as far as, right. you know, what you're bringing to the field. So could you guys just kind of talk through that piece? I can give you my perspective of it. So I've been pretty much a two-pitch pitcher most of my 
coming up early in my major league career. That's what I felt confident I was going to throw four seam fastballs and sliders. And I'd manipulate my slider. I'd make it cuttery and then bigger at times I saw fit. Um, and then as I kind of went into this year, tried to add more change-ups, tried to really make it a cutter to lefties, um, and then learned the sweeper about halfway through and loved the sweeper kind of right away. And then, so I'm kind of laughing because I've got five pitches and I'm a reliever and with pitch calm, the guy's sitting there hitting it. I'm shaking a bunch. And then um, Zombro was like, I think I got some things that can help you. You know, we played together, had that relationship. So coming here early in the off season, he's like, you need to be throwing a two-seamer. Like, all right, let's add another pitch to it. And uh, I was skeptical. Um, and even the first couple days throwing, he's like, that's good on the, you know, break charts. And I'm like, is it? And um, kind of the more I've thrown it and gotten comfortable seeing other guys' metrics that are around there, I'm excited to see how it'll play. Yeah, I think... Um also, we'll rewind back. So, four seam guy tapped into that young in your career in Minnesota. But the big thing for us was he was a first rounder out of Georgia Tech. I wanted to see what the slot looked like then, right. how he was moving then versus now. He's up to 98 out of college. And your velo is close to that. But obviously, I wanted Could to be look, more. Yeah. Certainly. I wanted to see the epitome of how he moved best. Right. And with that, his slot was five, six inches lower coming out of college. Yeah. So I thought if that's the posture. Also, Luke loves doing athletic throwing type drills. That's right. what I feel my like and, a shortstop throw. Whenever a sling, he does it, it's always a lower slot. Always lower. Right. And so then we my looked, brother's got a lower slot. Same genetics. And that that was the other thing is we looked you know at his axis and efficiency on the four seam. It was nearly the same as your brother's. Right. Nature versus nurture. I'm like, okay, there. well if you move like this out right. with Georgia Tech, your brother throws like this now. Right. I think your body really wants yeah. to move that way. Yeah, it seems obvious saying it like that, right. but at the time you're like, all right, I've, you know, I've had some success in the big leagues. That's a pretty big change, but now throwing it feels comfortable, and I've got both. I'll still throw four right. seams up. Um, I think given hitters, you know, they go into an at bat, they can't game plan against one or the other. Um, I'll still throw four seams up at the top and sinkers down. Right. And hopefully, and you're no longer necessarily having to chase that vert either, right. because that, that again, three four years ago, that was kind of like the fad. Every right. team was like, okay, this. This is how everyone has to throw. Right. Now have you kind of learned that, hey, you can rely more on the sinker. Right. But still be able to get above the barrel with a, I don't know where you're at right now, right. 13, 15 vert, four seam. Right. Just from that lower slot. Yeah. It still plays up in the zone. Yeah. And if I want to, if I'm going for a swing and a miss, I'm probably going to go up. But, you know, 1-1, one, 2-1, one, 3-1 one, one count and I'm throwing a fastball, let's put it on the ground. You know, something where damage can't, can't be done. He's also a true data office member. Tell, tell Ben your approach now, release-wise, sinker versus four seam. Yeah, so um, I think just trying to make that play better, I kind of am going to try to think on the, the sinker, you know, I try to like stay on top and have my normal deliver on the four seam. I actually get lower and try to get more of that, you know, lower vertical approach to have a little more jumpy effect. Um, so literally the exact opposite of what a lot of people will coach on the four seam. Right, You're because I don't really care exa VAA exactly versus the actual right trooper. what the iPad says. I want to know how it's perceived in the box, right. and um, that's kind of the old school mindset that the hitter or catcher can tell you more than. Um, and ultimately, what, what results are happening, I'm going to go off of. But um, I, right now, that's will what you I still feel look good at about. the metrics at all? Like, hey, I still want to see this above like 12 or 14, like vert, or do you not care um, if it's like nine vert? As long as the hitter says, hey, that was kind no, of No, they still stay around 15, but 15, a couple years ago, I would have been, if I threw a, right. if I threw a bullpen with 15, I would have thought I'm cutting the ball or doing right. something wrong. You know, I was trying to see the 20s. Now, 15, I don't care. I just know right. if a guy's seen a sinker and I'm in a lower slot and it's up in the right spot, it's going to look jumpy to him. Talk about the, obviously, you're drafted by the Twins, first rounder. Um, talk about how you changed throughout that time. You had injury history, right. how you fought through that. Yep. Give us give us the rundown of your early yeah. minor league career. Yeah, it feels like forever ago now. Um, and obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but um, had a pretty serious shoulder surgery. Missed the first uh, two and a half years of my professional career. Um, and then once I had that surgery, I was pretty much good to go. Um, I felt like I was ready to go and I was kind of their broken toy at that point. I was kind of, I had been passed up and wasn't really part of their plans. It took me having a really good year between double and triple A to get rule five. Um, and thankfully that happened. Angels gave me an opportunity, made that team. Um, it has not been all perfect from there. Um, you know, rode the option train kind of my whole career up and down. Um, but kind of whatever's happened, I just try to keep going, try to keep getting better. and. 
Um, I'm still looking for my first full major league season and, you know, hopefully stick somewhere for good. Yeah, I want to circle back on your brother yeah. because I had TOS surgery. You connected yep. me with Daniel. Yep. Obviously, Daniel's great. Love him. Uh, but I also love his story from your perspective. Right. And Daniel's been on the podcast. Yep. But tell it, tell it from your side. Yeah. So Daniel and I are close. And obviously, baseball's brought us, you know, we have a lot, lot to talk about. We balance whatever we're going through at the time um, we talk about. So his career, to me, he got to the big leagues quick and was dominant. He kind of threw 100 when nobody threw 100 and, you know, super proud brother. Brother was the greatest thing in the world. And um, pretty quickly, he lost it. He went from being like, I can get anyone out on planet Earth to I can't even throw strikes in a minor league game. And it was a perfect storm of, you know, thoracic outlet and switching to starting. And that's a whole other story. Um, but I saw him kind of grind and battle back and never really got back. And this was like a five year process him signing minor league deals, see him in spring, and like, he can't throw a strike. And it was really, it was hard to watch. And he would call me, we'd talk through it, had a good day, had a bad day. Um, I mean, I think he was about as frustrated as a human can be, because he knew how good he was. He knew it was himself holding him right. back. Um, and he couldn't retire on that note. And it took just years of him. I mean, he's trying sidearm. I mean, I, I don't know how he did it. The perseverance he showed, he kept trying, kept trying. And then he called me one day and he was like, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And I was like, thank goodness he's done. For him sake, I was just, he needed to move on. And he goes into coaching and he'd send me videos. He'd be like, I threw a bullpen with the Diamondbacks. We're trying to learn on pitch grips and spin rates and stuff. I hit 94 today and stuff. And we laugh, whatever. And a couple years go by, he'd be like, with the big league team, played catch. And so-and-so said, I need to keep playing and laugh. And then um, the off season going into the COVID year, he calls me, he's like, hey, I want to come up and throw bullpens with you guys work out with four or five major league guys like sure come i thought he just doing it for to see what he's got still and uh he comes in he's taking it seriously like like a professional pitcher would and he's like 96 miles an hour and throwing strikes and filling it up i'm like have you been throwing <laughs> he's like yeah i've been throwing i was like are you making a comeback he goes we'll see how today goes and it went about as good as it could um chad pender was in there emilio pagan will myers they're like dude you gotta you gotta keep playing and um he goes to the Diamondbacks and I think hopes he's a coach with them and he, he's hoping that they'll say, sure, come over to the minor league side and pitch this spring. If it doesn't go well, you can have your job coaching. Um, if it goes well, sure, you got a spot. And uh, they pretty much were like, we can't sign you, have coaches going to playing, but we wish you the best of luck. So he called me that day and he was like, I just quit my job and I've got three kids and I don't have a job baseball wise. So um, at that time, he's kind of fumbling agent schedules a workout for him spring training started at this point 2020 and he's throwing 99 miles an hour in a tryout and has five offers before he can take his cleats off and uh signs with the rockies and then COVID hits he pitched once and pitched terrible his first outing which at the time i'm like this is good we're gonna see what he's got he threw again against the dodgers and i think struck out the side on like 11 pitches and then COVID hit shut down so he's going home he's like i'm gonna be released like they i was the last guy in the camp I've been there two weeks um he ends up going to the summer camp in colorado and was lights out and made the team and uh yeah his story's remarkable from my perspective as that so, was going on like what was what was going through your mind were you were you like holding your breath did you think that was like a likely comeback um like uh, what, what was going through your head as he was you know having these ups i wanted to be a supportive brother um but i also didn't want to see him go through the frustration he went through before once I saw him throw, I was like, all right, this is different. He's back and his mindset's different. You knew it wasn't different. still the same. It was a right. different Daniel. Yeah. Like you weren't like you worried he was going to come back every yeah. single outing. Because he didn't really care. He's like, if it doesn't go well, I throw bad in five more spring training games. And I'm back. Like, he I was at care. peace with whatever outcome because he'd already he decided care. he was going to retire. Yes. This is all and I think like... it took completely retiring, right. completely detaching, and seeing the game as a coach, trying to help guys and seeing that, like, all right, this is a major league baseball game, but it really doesn't matter in the long term. And at the moment, you're a young kid, um, you put a lot of pressure on yourself to be good. And uh, it doesn't help. It doesn't make you perform any better. Actually not caring and uh, not attaching an outcome and just being free makes you perform better. Is that something that you struggle with yourself? Like try, caring too much, trying too hard? Yeah. What, how, do you, how, do you, how do you detach? Like how do you make that it's separation? A, it's a skill, I think. I think. I don't think there's any athlete out there that's not good because he doesn't care enough. There might be a super talented player, but 99% of guys 
aren't good because they don't care. Everybody wants to be good. I go through that absolutely. When you're optioned and you've been in AAA and then you get called up, like, and you know you might pitch and get optioned again, but you're like, I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna be so impressive that they're gonna make me stay. And you can't be that way. You have to just make good pitches and try to get out. So I, I definitely want to ask about your story of adversity too, because we've talked about the shoulder surgery a little right. bit. Um, and you know, Daniel having gone through all all that he went through right. and how impressed you were. But I mean, you definitely have been through a lot of adversity yourself. So um, one of the reasons we got initially linked up was because of your your hip surgery and your hip right. injury history. So after you came back from the, the shoulder thing and initially you know made it to the big leagues take us through the hip injury how did that happen you know at what point did you know like hey this is a legit problem that's really holding me back right and then just uh, take me through that process um it was a long i think i have the just you know genetics of impingement and i pitched with it my whole career and it would kind of be sore and bark but i was like it's not my arm i can deal with it velo and everything was fine and it really wasn't till the 20 2021 spring I went it kind of bugged me 2020 year but I only threw like seven innings in the big leagues um and that spring of 21 I was throwing 90 and I couldn't walk off the mound after I pitched I was like I gotta do something here um and then I remember the doc seeing the doc in spring training he was like son you need your hip replaced I looked at him like I'm 30 years old you're out of your mind and saw some more specialists and sure enough that was what I needed yeah, I'm thinking maybe my career's over. Um, I got it done and it was, you know, whether it was a gift from God or whatever, I felt like I had a second chance. I felt like I'd been given the keys to Ferrari, the way my hip moved. Um, and then being able to pitch this year pain-free was just so nice. So what was going through your head when you were initially told like, hey, you have no, basically a fully arthritic hip at 30, right. like, you have no cartilage left, right. you're gonna need and at that point, did you know that you were going to be getting a resurfacing or did you kind of evaluate like, hey, there's a bunch of different options? Like, did they give you multiple options? Did you give no, multiple it opinions was pretty or was much, like, hey, this yeah. is your only possible chance? It's a toss up. Like, what was your thought going into that? Were they like, hey, this is a pretty good chance of working like Andy Murray's had it, you know, Colby Luce had it. Or is it like, hey, we have no idea if you're going to be able to make it back. But like, this is our only shot. Um At the time, you know, they tell you you need your hip replaced. I'm, I'm thinking all those thoughts. Um, and then I went and saw Dr. Sue, did my surgery, and he was like, you're going to be fine. But don't be scared of a little bit of metal in your body. Like, your joint's going to move, you're going to be as explosive. And I've done all these hockey players. Um, it just hasn't come to baseball yet. It's kind of getting into the right. NBA, tennis. It's big in the UFC, it's big in hockey. It'll come to baseball, you're just going to be one of the first. Um, so I took it as a challenge, like I do most things, and um, was going to find a way back, you know, no matter if it was in my power to get back, I was going to find a way to do it. 100%. And I know for me personally, like having just had the surgery two weeks ago, like talking to you, like really convinced me like this is, this is worth like right. rolling the dice a little bit right. on. Um, Cause either, you know, retiring and just not being able to throw a pain free ever again, or like, you know, kind of being a trailblazer in, in a sense, like there's right. not that many pitchers who have professional pitchers who've had, who have metal in their right. hip. So on some level, like, you know, there, there's an experimentation piece to that process. Right. But, also, like to your point, like you weren't ready to, you know, throw in the towel. Right. I know for me, like wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Yeah. So, I wouldn't. Uh, I know that was really helpful for me just to hear your perspective. Know, like, okay, well, you're walking normally four weeks later. Like you were throwing 95 in the bullpen up six months later. It's like right. that's in- incredible for how invasive that surgery really is. Like when it when it yeah. comes down to it. And like, I told you, I told you not to watch the video of the surgery. I watched the and video. You said anyway. you'd already watched it. Um, yeah. It's a uh, credit to the doctor and, and whatever, but um, I, and I told you it's nothing to be scared of. Guys have arthroscopic surgery all the time. I think that's worse because you're mending what's already there. When you get a new, um, a new joint, it's out of surgery. It's, it's perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. You just got to learn to control it. I'm glad, I'm glad you convinced Ben because when I first told, yeah. I mean, and I know you've had hip stuff for, right. forever, like because he and I were playing catch right. every morning and, you know, he would do 10 toe throws, be fine. But the moment you started going into a leg lift and you had the combination of flexion yeah. and IR, like his hips yeah. killing him the next day. Yeah. I remember I just made like the offhand comment. I was like, oh, like you need a cobalt hip. Yep. And he looked at me like I was full of shit. And I was like, I'm being serious. Like yeah. you need to talk to Luke Bard. And that's right around the yeah. time you started yeah. coming in. Yeah. What, what's funny is, so I, w- I was watching the Andy Murray documentary, like the hip re- called resurfacing. Right. And you're watching him go through this, you know, arthroscopy like labor repair rehab and you're kind of watching him struggle and it's still bugging him he's not quite his old self and i'm like this is literally me to a t for the last four years right. and then he finds out about this new procedure and now he's getting obsessive yep. and now his like wife or girlfriend yep. is like you know it's all he talks about yeah. he's watching all these videos yeah. and i'm like that's literally me right now like right 
as soon as that he kind of planted that seed, it was like, oh, no, wait, I'm not going to get metal in my hip. And then, you know, once that seed was planted, it started researching, started learning yep. more, talked to you. Like, I mean, you have full range of motion, need a chest. Like, like okay, I, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to find out everything I can. Like, let's give it a shot. So, yeah, you know, I appreciate, obviously, all your help, like, Absolutely. to this point, And I'm sure over the next six months, as I try to yeah. continue figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah, and I got no doubt you'll kill it. It's uh, it's nothing to be scared of, and I'm sure we'll see it get into baseball more and more as time goes on. 100%. So I, I guess question for Zombra, like what what are you guys really focusing on now, going into spring training, going to the season? Like what's what's something that if he executes on, like he's going to be just fine this year? Uh, yeah, sinker. Um, frankly, like I don't. He's going to be on a major league roster very soon. There's no doubt in my Thank mind. You. Yeah. I mean, he's he's been pitching with that four seam, essentially a two pitch guy, four seam slider out of the pen right. for years. And like when he was in LA or Anaheim, I should say, uh, you know, he's going four seam, hard gyro slider, and that's kind of about it. Right. And now he's and got- when, And had success with it at times. Right. So know that those right. pitches can have success in the right spots. He, uh, we had a funny exchange via text, which, Luke's also hilarious, so you might not repeat some of those. <laughs> I can't. I can't repeat a lot of things he says, but it's hilarious. Mm. And you talk about yeah. being, you know, not caring and loose. This is probably the loosest guy in a clubhouse yeah. ever. So, um, but within that, you know, we were texting back and forth, thinking about he pitched in the big leagues with two pitches, which I would argue now your sinker and sweeper both grayed out way better than those two than before. Yep. And so I, I, do you remember I asked you, I said, how did you ever pitch without the sinker? <laughs> I said, uh, I did. It just got me DFA three times right. the year Didn't before. So high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And it's a work in progress. I mean, I'm, you know, you just got to keep getting better. You've seen a lot of pitchers reinvent themselves and a lot of pit take a lot of pitchers into their thirties to really figure it out. Pitching is a, it's an art, it's really difficult. Um, every time I step on a major league mound, I'm reminded how difficult it is. It's hard to pitch in front of 40,000 people. Strike zones are keyholes and hitters are good. Um, and I love that it's that harder. Everybody in this room that's in here training would be in the big leagues. Uh, I welcome the challenge. Um, don't fear, fear failure. Um, you're going to fail at times, but if you can keep getting better, if you can be really loose, really aggressive, I think that's the best way to pitch. Yeah. So for this year, to go back to your question, uh, I think obviously the new fastball profile is huge. It's it's a sinker. Yeah. Nobody's seen it. It's sharp. It's late. It's all seam effects. He still has the and four seam. It should pair with sliders technically better than Correct. a four seam. He's now, you know, he was fighting hard to get vertical on the four seam at 18 to 20 vert. And honestly, beating his head against the wall to right. not cut the ball. Right. Right. Natural supinator. Right. We knew that about him. That's why I also knew dropping the slot right. get you the seam shifted sinker. Yep. Once you see it a few times, you'll be bought in. Right. It'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but you know, now he was going from a point of 18 vert, zero, maybe into the negative slightly vertically on the slider, creating 20 inches of separation. Right. I mean, now on an average pen basis, if he's not 35 to 40 inches east west, like it's a bad day. Yeah. So the arsenal is just yeah. spread out all over. Right. And I think like you didn't throw in our pro day and I texted a few local guys to come out. And I think seven or eight, you know, pro yeah. scouting guys did come out because you watch him pitch now and he can do everything from that slot. Yeah. The sinker's there. He can throw a, a change up that he decides to cut a little more with more depth. He's got the four seam he can shoot up. He's got a hard cutter he can throw. He's got a gyro slider still in the back pocket and the sweeper. Yep. I joke that I you feel should be good a starter. About it. I, I love to start. Um, yeah, I've made jokes about it too. Like I'm gonna, with the pitch clock, I'm gonna have to be, a lot of times you're thrown to a catcher for the first time in a major league game and uh, you don't wanna be out there just shaking. Right, right, right. It's nice to get in a rhythm. Uh, but yeah, and I feel good about all my pitches. That's the thing too, is I don't wanna just become a two pitch guy. Like I like throwing them all. And it's nice to be out there and have options and a guy's had a five, six pitch at bat. I'm like, I'm about to throw him something he hadn't seen yet. It's a really good feeling as a pitcher as opposed to like, all right, he's seen the slider twice, but I'm trying to strike him out again with it here. Yeah. Um, it's like I'm throwing him a depthy changeup. I'm throwing him a bigger slider, something that he hadn't seen, or a four-seam fastball up. Yeah, it's, it's coincided great with his mindset because he is an artist on the mound. Like, you enjoy the nuances the, of pitching. I love – I love would rather sequencing. watch a Kluber pitch than a Glass now because Glass now is good at pitching because he's a freak and God gifted him abilities that I don't have. 
you watch Kluber pitch, and I'm like, he's getting guys out with an 87 because he's outsmarting him. He's going to the right spots. He's throwing a ton of strikes. Um, to me, that's like that's the art of pitching that I love. And I think now getting him again, just dropping his slot and posture to naturally where it was out of high school yep. when he was at Georgia Tech. You look at these things, and he can manipulate the ball so well right. from those slots. Did you have any issues with like? buying into that arsenal change because i know some guys who've thrown like a four seam like gyro slider like that combo or four seam curveball their whole career they're like very emotionally attached to like i gotta throw my four seam 60 70 percent of the time yeah like you tell them hey we might need a sinker we might need to change this that you know use the four seam less like there's resistance to that like what made you so open to that change? yeah, yeah. It, I, I always I, wondered do you think i was crazy or something no i mean it happened organically um, the two seam wasn't new for me. I threw it all through the minor leagues and like this kind of before track man, you know, this is like the early 2012, 2013, 14. And my catcher, if I threw a bullpen, he'd say your sinker's your best pitch. And then I would throw in like rap soda machines in like 2017 and then be like, your sinker's terrible. Right. And I would see kind of the sinkers across the league were, were leaving and I had really high spin rate, even though I didn't have high efficiency. So I didn't carry the ball elitely. Right. Um, so that kind of brought me to the two seam. Um, the sweeper, I was in Tampa, and it's Snyder, the pitching coach there, just said, hey, I think you've got the arm slot for a sweeper. Maybe just play around with one. And the grip he showed me, I threw a bullpen with him, and it was terrible, like embarrassingly bad. He's like, yeah, that's close. I'm like, if you think this can get a major league hitter out, you're out of your mind. And um, I finally found a grip that I liked, and uh, I took it into a game one night, and I threw this slow frisbee, and the guy missed it. And I'm like, Did that's you show a major us how hitter. You throw it for the, for the so camera. the Rays were teaching, I think, the Chaz Rowe, uh, kind of across the horseshoe and in tight. I've gone to a very loose grip, and I grab it like a two seam and just turn it, and it's very light, and that allows it to come out of my hand earlier. I think when I was like trying to throw a nasty sweeper, I was getting on top and getting some gyro spin. When I'm just kind of loose, just playing wiffle ball, and it just flings, and it's straight side spin. Are you uh, trying to feel it off both fingers at the same time, or are you trying to feel the that's another misconception? Come off first and the I was trying to second. feel it off the middle finger for a while. Once I realized like this is the main driver, it got a lot better. So, are you thinking kind of like throw a throw a curveball from the side with the index finger, or what's what's the cue? It's a going feel in head? my head. I'm like I'm sp I'm spinning it, but I, the last finger to touch the ball, what actually happens? I'm not sure. What I feel is this finger. It's a lot of, I don't know where the camera is. I'm really through that side of the ball. But you're not ripping down, you're ripping no, through it's sideways. No, I'm on the side, like I'm lower. It's two fingers Got pushing it. through that side of the ball. When it was just one, it would get real slow. Is that, is that something where for you, when you throw one, even in catch play, without track man, without data, it's very obvious when you throw a good one? Like, is that something players can work on on their own? Yeah. Without necessarily needing. I think your body tells you. Right. Uh, you can tell. You definitely can it's, such, catch. it's such a big break. I know the tell. feeling of a good one and a bad one, and I chase that feeling of a good one. It's kind of the way with all my pitches. Um, and I don't need more movement. I'd rather have that one that's like harder and takes a left turn as opposed to the one that's like, oh, that broke 25 inches, but kind of broke the whole way. I want that one that's. Have you gone down that turn. rabbit hole of like trying to chase max, max, max horizontal break and sweep? Yeah. Or? How did you find that sweet spot? Just experimentation? I think, um, yeah, there's a point where enough is enough, and then you commanding it and throwing it, hopefully with some more velo, is better. The big ones are good. They get You get a lot of free takes, but also you might throw an 0-2 one that's this far off that froze the guy, and he's just not swinging at it because he just sees a pitch moving a lot. One other question here. like, As a reliever, could you kind of walk us through what your routine is? I, most relievers have like very specific routines. Are you like super focused, super serious? Are you just hanging out, joking around? Like, do you have a specific inning where you start to really tune into the game, get your arm care going? Like, walk us through typical yeah. nine inning game. Like, what do you do inning to inning? Yeah, I like to play long toss pregame, not with a ton of effort, but I get to a pretty good amount of distance just because I like the feeling of like freedom and looseness. Um, might get a little mound work if I haven't thrown in a while, but usually stay away from that and try to, you know, maintain freshness. I think pitchers battle fatigue in season more than anything else. Um, and then pregame, yeah, I've got a whole routine. I spend probably at least a couple hours in the weight room of just the foam rolling, stretching, mobility that a lot of guys are doing. Um, I cold tub and hot tub before every game. I think that puts my mind in a pretty good spot. I'm doing that, you know, 15 minutes before I go out. Get dressed, go out, and then the role I've always been in, I've got to be kind of ready to go from first pitch to the last. Um, so watch how the starter's doing. If he's in any trouble, yeah, I get kind of moving around. 
not in a panic, just like I'm going to have my heart rate up a little bit here in case I got to get going. Um, and if I got to get going quick, I can. Um, I've had outings where you get a few pitches and you go in and you're fine. Uh, you know, maybe I just threw eight fastballs and I'm in the game and you're fine. So there's no like worry, like, oh, if I don't throw my breaking ball, I'm not like throwing my change up for a strike in the bullpen, then I'm going to go out there and be bad. Like, I'm just kind of focused on, I'm getting loose to go pitch. Right. I'm not like, I'm not trying to dial in pitches. So you don't necessarily so I, need to get like this perfect 12, 15, 20 pitch no. pre-outing bullpen. Yep. You're just okay with going with the flow, whatever right. happens. I don't happens, really care where the ball's out. going. I'm trying to just like feel loose and free in the ball out of my hand. Um, and then if I've got time, I'll start throwing pitches and try and kind of locate. But I don't throw a ton. Um, I get loose pretty quick, um, which is a good thing to have as a reliever. Um, is that something you had to train yourself to be able to do as a reliever? Because obviously you haven't necessarily relieved for like your entire baseball career. Like, right. is that something that like is, is trainable for those who haven't necessarily been in the bullpen as long or are trying to I make that transition? I think it's just mentally knowing like I can do it. The guys, some guys get kind of married to their hour routine and routines are great. I think that helps keep you healthy and perform, but uh, you can't be mentally tied to like, if I, I, I can't pitch well without that. Um, and the best relievers I've played with, I always said you can tell how good a reliever is by when the phone rings and their name's called, how slow they take their sweatshirt off. If the guy's taking it off quick, I'm like, this guy's not good. He's if, rattled if, already. If they call it and he's taking it off really slowly, I'm like, this guy probably shoves. And uh, that's usually the case. I guess my final question for you then would be this. What would your advice be for younger players? What do you wish someone had told you when you were in high school or even before that? Uh, or what was something that was told to you when you were at, you know, at a young age? Yeah, um, one of the best pieces of advice I got, I was a rookie in the big leagues and I was playing with Blake Wood, who was a reliever. Um, he went to Georgia Tech. I didn't know him at Tech, he was older than me. Um, and then we were both on the Angels together. And um, he had kind of gotten to that point of just not caring. And I'm like, you know, how'd you get, he goes, Everything that you think is the worst thing that could happen to you as a pitcher in the game of baseball has happened to me, and I'm still here making millions of dollars. He was like, I was like a prospect, failed starter, terrible in the minor leagues. He'd been released I don't know how many times. He'd blown out his elbow on one pitch. It had Tommy John. He had another surgery too, I think. He had gone to indie ball. Um, he had been on a big league mound and couldn't throw a strike. He went into a game and I think threw like 12 straight balls and pulled. Um, he said he battled the yips. He was like, the worst thing that you think could happen, he goes, but I'm still here because I kept grinding. I never let any of those moments um, say this is going to be the end for me. Um, and I was like, dang. He was like, the day you stop grinding, the day that you're like, I got an excuse to stop, you're done. And I, that, like, he gave me chills because I was like, I've so many times in my career, I've been like, oh, I had a major shoulder surgery, I could be done. Um, organization that kind of sent me in the wrong direction, that's a great excuse to be done. Hip, hip surgery, great excuse to be done. I've been DFA'd three times, but like, I've never stopped trying to get better, keep grinding. Um, and I don't know where my story will end. I know that I love the game of baseball. I love the process of trying to get better. Um, if baseball ended today, I'd be a happy guy. Uh, not all my eggs are in there, but I do love the game of baseball. I love being in a locker room. Um, and those things just drive me to keep wanting to get better. I don't think there's many people in the big leagues that, it, you know, maybe the Mike Trouts of the world where it's just all rainbows and sunshine. You guys can both speak to that. My brother can speak to that. Like, you got a crazy story. Um, you know, you probably never would have thought that would have happened. You got a crazy story. My brother's got a crazy story. Like, the race isn't won by the fastest or the strongest. It's the one who can, like, take the biggest beating and endure the most. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we're better people for it. We're better to be around. We have an appreciation for where we're at. Walking out in, you know, Tropicana or in Yankee Stadium with a big league uniform on is a blessing. And it's incredible. It's an incredible experience. Um, and I don't take it for granted. Um, whereas say my life had gone perfectly, I'd probably be a spoiled big leaguer, you know? I don't know what I'd, what I'd be right. like. It's um, getting to that point, I guess, really for all of us, where like you're just at peace with whatever outcome happens, right. but like you're gonna do everything you possibly can right. to get as far as you possibly can. And if if you don't make it, you don't make it. If your career ends tomorrow, it ends tomorrow, right. but you That's did everything you possibly could. Right. Z's talked about like, I'm playing with house money at this point. Like I never thought I'd be this far. I feel the same you're way. Playing. Like, yep. you know, so I think I think it's getting to that point where that's actually where you have the, the highest probability of a good outcome, right. where you're detached from right. what's really happening. Right. I'm okay with what happens. Let the cards fall how they fall. Yes, and that's I'm how it has to be.
so much of life is out of our control, I feel like. I've learned that the hard way. Um, I just try to trust God that he'll put me where I want me. Um, I signed with the Blue Jays. That probably wouldn't have been where I thought I would have ended up when the offseason started. Um, but I'm really excited to be there. Um, and that's where God wants me. That's where I'm going to go. Um, yeah. I think the other crazy thing is, like, you were drafted senior sign, though, right? I'm a free agent, senior guy. You're a first rounder. But, like, all of our past have had this adversity kick right. to them. And I look, I look at your story specifically. I talked to Keller about this some, too, because uh, he was a high pick, yep. second rounder or whatever. But uh, just looking at that from your yeah. lens, like, how much did that shape you being first rounder? You're throwing bullets out of Georgia Tech. Right. You have the surgery with the twins. Just how much did that shape you right, at, right out of the gate? Yeah, um, and I was, I had actually, I was drafted hurt. You, you don't know, you're naive at that age. I think I'm gonna be in the big leagues in like, a, you know, a year or two. Uh, looking back, that's funny to say, I, and I had to get healthy and had my own problems, but I feel like everything happens for a reason. Like we connected in Durham, you know, I put you in touch with my brother. You both had, had TOS. Now I'm here with you. I wouldn't even be in here if it wasn't for him, but now you just had the same surgery I had that nobody's had. Like, what are the, what are the right. chances that? I didn't even know Tread was in Charlotte until I followed you guys on social media forever and love the stuff you put out. And I'm like, they're in Charlotte, holy smokes. I didn't even know. Um, so I just think, yeah, things happen for a reason and they work out the way they're supposed to. And um, I try not to get too, you know, worried that failure is gonna happen or, yeah. you know, but um, yeah, that's the path I've been on. and. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Awesome. Well, appreciate your time. Yeah, guys. Appreciate the insight. Yeah. So best of luck this season. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. How long was that? That was perfect. That was probably 40. 45 minutes. Yeah, right. perfect. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Great job. Enjoyed it. Great job. Got some great highlights. Yep. <laughs>